I came across this article one day, and Councillor Mamalidi mentions that there is a communist movement hiding in the NDP. Now most Canadians would see this and immediately consider this a conspiracy theory and ridicule the councillor. But you must take a closer look at the NDP, its members, their policies, and their ideologies, past and present. I'd like to begin by presenting a photograph that has been taken from Facebook. This is a photograph from what is described as a Vietnam hat party, which happened to be another roaring success on a Friday afternoon at the Red Square. You can clearly tell that these are a group of communists that are celebrating the Vietnam Red Army. Now take a closer look at the people that are in this photograph. You probably don't recognize anyone. So let me introduce you to Jim Treasure. Jim is the incumbent NDP male Tatch and district leader of Yukon. Meet Jan Stick. Jan is the incumbent NDP Riverdale South district leader of Yukon. Finally, we have the feminist activist Lois Moorcroft. Lois is the incumbent NDP Copper Belt South district leader of Yukon. As you can see, there are only six constituencies in the Yukon, and we can make a safe assumption that half these people in charge of the Yukon territories are communists. This only scratches the surface of the communist movement hiding in the NDP and the Canadian government. Would it present a security risk to Canada if a, a uh, politician in Canada, or a candidate perhaps, uh, had previous ties to the Chinese Communist Party, would that worry you? Well, if you're referring to the situation in BC, I'm, I'm not going to talk about any national security in issues, but certainly you're not surprised that there are members of the Communist Party or ex-members of the Communist Party inside the new Democratic Party. Are, are you surprised? You, you don't sound like you're surprised at all by this. Well, no, I think we've had uh, members of the in the House of Commons uh, presently in the NDP who have run for the Communist Party. So, pardon me? Is that a bad thing to you? We've no, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, uh, why would you be surprised? Thanks, everyone. They're new Democrats. The writing of Richmond Center has a red scare, with one of its candidates admitting he was a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Were you once a member of the Communist Party in China? Uh, yes. Even I have the background uh, in China, I uh, have the background as a member of the C CCP. Frank Wong immigrated to Canada in 2001 and admits he worked for and was a member of the ruling Communist Party in China. This all came out in a recent televised debate on a Vancouver Chinese language station. Huang told reporters he was young when he joined the Communist Party, sympathized with their views and wanted to help his community. But he says he gave it all up the year before he moved to Canada and became a citizen. It is so disrespectful to say that people who uh, come to Canada and are part of the community in Canada can't and are Canadian citizens can't participate in politics in Canada. Frank's a great candidate and he's doing going to do a, an excellent job here. And you know, I mean, it is, I think, um, disrespectful um, to make these kind of statements, uh, really, uh, which the Liberal Party thinks it feel, feel, feels free to do. And I am not surprised that they are faking their names when they make these kind of allegations. It is disrespectful. And it is time that this stopped. Wrong. We've seen the tactics of the Liberal Party now. We've seen their approach, right? It's quick wins all the time. Uh, and so the idea that people who immigrate to Canada uh, from countries that are not democracies, can't participate in democracy in Canada, is I think so disrespectful, so opposite to the Canadian tradition, that I think, um, uh, you know, I don't think, uh, frankly, the Liberal Party is doing itself any favors. The point is not that you are an immigrant. The point is that you were affiliated to one of the great organs of, of mass destruction and pain in, in, in the, the 21st and 20th century, the Communist Party of China. However, we've learned many times that um, uh, Canadian politics is not really the prime place for an intelligent discussion of ideas. How do you defend this, especially when we consider that CSIS has raised concerns about agents of the Chinese government working in the media uh, with their number one targets being top politicians in Canada? The head of Canada's Security and Intelligence Service 
has divulged some shocking information to CBC News, revealing details about foreign government espionage right here on Canadian soil involving Canadian politicians. Richard Fadden made it clear CSIS is now keeping an eye on those politicians. It all came out during the extraordinary access CSIS gave to our former senior correspondent, Brian Stewart. Canada's Security Intelligence Service rarely talks publicly. When it does, people listen. In an exclusive interview with CBC, the CSIS director, Richard Fadden, exposed foreign penetration right into Canadian politics. We're in fact a bit worried in a couple of uh, provinces that we have an indication that there's some uh, political, uh, political figures who have developed quite an attachment to foreign countries. Fadden's most startling revelation, cabinet ministers in two unnamed provinces are under control of foreign governments, what are in espionage circles called agents of influence or secret supporters. So for that matter are several members of B.C. municipal governments. But very important principles of the rule of law and governance may have been compromised. So in that sense, I think CSIS... Uh, may feel that it wants to let the public know and indeed let those individuals and governments know uh, that they're being scrutinized. Uh, Frank, thank you for joining us. Um, you came to Canada in 2001, but before that you were living and working in Hong Kong and you were a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Can you tell us why? Did you have to be a member of the party in order to work? Yes, uh, as many uh, Chinese immigrants, they, uh, they may know uh, Many people, uh, they work in the uh, Chinese government. Uh, yeah, they, are, they were expected to join the party uh, because uh, it's the special uh, political system in China. Not true. Not true at all. Not true at all. This wasn't required. You volunteered. You wanted to be. Can you, can you explain to Canadians what it means to be a member of the Communist Party of China? Where, you know, are you told what to do, what to say, things like that? Uh, okay, uh, I, wa I graduated uh, from the university in 1986. Uh, uh, At that time, I don't have the cho choice to uh, choose uh, which uh, organization, which company I I, I, I will go going to so uh, the university assigned me to the provincial government of Guangdong province. Uh, if I join the government, uh, everybody expect uh, the workers in the government should be a, a member of the Communist Party. Now, as I mentioned, you came to Canada in 2001. You've been working here mostly as a journalist ever since. Have you ever been a member of the Chinese Communist Party since coming to Canada? Uh, no, I already quit the party uh, since uh, uh, June uh, 2000, uh, when I uh, st studied in uh, France. I already quit the, uh, the party there. Your conservative opponent, Lawrence Chen, he says that because you have still been writing reports for China's state-owned newspapers while you were here in Canada, he says that that's a sign that you are still doing things for the Communist Party in China. I know uh, Mr. Chen uh, mentioned uh, I did an interview in February 2007. Uh, yeah, but I just uh, I, I just work as, uh, as our finance for the Chinese magazine uh, is nothing to do with the membership of, uh, for Communist Party because uh, yeah, quite a lot of uh, Chinese media uh, find somebody overseas to do the finance and also uh, uh, correspondent to find the news, find the interesting, interesting story for them. Uh, at that time, the magazine uh, uh, find me, uh, yeah, they, they think uh, it might be an yeah, interesting topic uh, for the Chinese reader because uh, it's the Chinese story. So uh, they let me do an interview uh, for Mr. Chen and I worked as a finance. Actually, I'm also the finance uh, for the Radio Canada International 
and also the website for uh, Financial Times. So uh, it's quite a normal thing. Uh, it's not nothing special. It's nothing to do with my background. Uh, I need to be a member of the Communist Party to do that kind of thing. Okay, sorry, just to repeat that so we're clear here, you're saying you do not need to be a member of the Communist Party in order to freelance for newspapers in China. No, 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 uh, because uh, quite a lot of Chinese media uh, uh, contact with me, uh, let me do some uh, job and uh, let me uh, write the article for them as uh, finance. I just do a finance. I'm not a full-time reporter or, uh, or the staff for uh, Chinese media. And one of the reasons we're interested, voters are interested in, in your background, is because we've been warned here in Ottawa by the head of Canada's spy service, Richard Fadden, or former head of the spy service, and he has said that the Chinese government routinely uses journalists to spy on Canada and Canadians. I'm not sure that, that kind of case, but uh, for me, I'm, I'm not doing such kind of things. Uh, actually, I'm also the... Uh, I was the, uh, one of the recipients for um, uh, Jeff Webster yeah. Awards 2005. Uh, yeah, uh, the job I'm here, everybody knows, uh, including the mainstream uh, media, English media, they all know me uh, a lot about that. Yeah. Well, Frank Wong, uh, good luck in Richmond Center, and thank you so much for speaking with us today. Okay, thank you so much, David. When, uh, at least if, if we understand it correctly, he wasn't working for the government, he was actually working directly for the party. Then he came out to Canada um, where he um, started a Chinese language newspaper distributed free in Chinatowns to um, uh, target it towards new immigrants from China. And one could see that if, if his career was in, involved in trying to uh, create a good impression of the Chinese regime among overseas Chinese, that that starting a newspaper in Canada and, and writing articles favorable to uh, the Chinese regime would be a good way to continue that work. It would make sense. And then uh, more disturbingly, um, we, we hear from a person that he came to visit someone who was starting a new political party focused on Chinese Canadians, said that he wanted to have a, uh, an interview with them for the People's Daily newspaper that he was evidently working for. That's the Chinese Communist Party's official newspaper. Don't people who come to Canada from China, don't they want to get away from this communist rule and therefore wouldn't they not sympathize with the government? July 2007, Chen was the leader of a new Asian Canadian party called the National Alliance Party. At that time, Huang was a freelance newspaper reporter and wrote an article on Chen. The news outlet? The People's Daily, the official newspaper of the Chinese Communist government. Chen showed us a copy of the article, pointing to a byline of what he says is Huang's name. Remember, this is seven years after Huang says he cut ties with the Chinese government. We, we all know if people working in that agency should be Communist Party member. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it, uh, but Mr. Huang, Frank Huang, he said the same words, he's uh, working in a Chinese government. If you would like to go goes up, you have to be drawing the party member. At first, Huang denied it when we asked him if he was a reporter for the news agency, but then later said he misunderstood our question and admitted he was a freelancer for the paper, as he was with many other news outlets in Asia and North America. Several years ago, when Wang interviewed Lawrence Chen, the conservative party member for Richmond Center, Chen says Wang allegedly told him he was still a Communist Party member. So the question arises, is Wang a communist or not? I'm not honest. We now have a situation where an NDP candidate in British Columbia was a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, the Chinese Communist Party has killed far more people than the Nazis ever did in Germany. I suppose the Nazis didn't have enough time, did they? But this is a, a vile, vicious organ of anti-democracy that has murdered so many innocent people. You don't have to be a member of the Communist Party in China. You volunteer to be. Well, Michael, as you were saying, I mean, it's not that the NDP is a radical left party per se, but certainly here in BC they have a lot of radical left uh, factions. The NDP is rather good at uh, refusing to tolerate candidates who have any opinion outside of the party norm. They've, they've done this throughout the country. But you, have a, you have an NDP leader in BC who's committed fraud, who's lied, who, who was thrown out of his position as a, an, an advisor.
The NDP is worried about its image, and they want to consider moving away from socialism at their convention this weekend. Perhaps they should worry more about moving away from other things first. So I read through this. I mean, they want to take socialists out, and I read through it, and then it says democratic socialist. Okay, well, how's that different? You just, you're, you're going to vote to take over the bicycle factory instead of storm it? What is that? <laughs> I don't know. Apparently, Thomas Mulcair is okay with communists, or at least communist sympathizers, sitting in his NDP shadow cabinet. We told you yesterday about the story of Alexandre Bolleris, the new Democrat from Montreal who called the Battle of Vimy Ridge repugnant and described the shining Canadian achievement of the First World War as one where thousands of poor buggers were massacred to capture a ridge. To Bolleris, this was not a war to liberate a free people from an invading oppressor, but rather a war of bourgeois who always wanted more money, a purely capitalist war on the backs of workers and farmers. Those words can only come from someone who really does believe in the communist cause, because really, who speaks like that? Even in French, who speaks like that? The only ones who refused this butchery, who rejected the call of this sacred union within each nation, were the communist activists. When I worked in Montreal, the only people that spoke that way were the hardcore leftist radicals. That is Marxist language. As mentioned last night, Bouleris is clearly a communist, or at least a sympathizer. Ask yourself this, though. What would happen if a conservative MP had blogged about Nazi sympathies in 2007 and then reaffirmed those sympathies when asked in 2011? Would he still be in caucus? Would Stephen Harper still want him as part of the conservative party? Would the media be silent? No. In fact, Mulcair won't even comment on this, nor will he get Bouleris to explain or back away. Ray, um, are you... Are you surprised that this is, is happening in the NDP? I know that well, we, we associate them with some crazy ideas, but are you surprised that they're, they're letting a, a guy who praises the communists and damns the troops stay in their caucus or, or not explain um, it even? I think this shows that Malker is no Jack Layton. He's weak. He's afraid. Frankly, he's a coward. He should publicly repudiate this idiot, but the fact that he doesn't do it is easy to understand, Brian. Guess what it is? What? This clown is not the only pro-communist, crypto-separatist in the rank, ranks of the NDP, which is basically a Quebec party. He has lots of bedfellows and bed sisters who agree with what he says. Some of which, for the NDP side, are outside the mainstream. For example, here is, uh, this is the Marxist voice of labor and youth. It's being uh, distributed here at the NDP convention. And these Marxists will be trying to get the NDP to, quote, pull out of NAFTA, uh, the WTO, and other bankers' deals that are the tools of imperialist exploitation. Uh, Harper did point out that uh, Bouleris and others have ties to a very radical separatist outfit, radical left-wing separatist outfit in Quebec called Quebec Solidaire. Do you think there'll be any Quebec Solidaire noise in, in Montreal? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I was just on Twitter a minute ago looking at all the people gathering on Twitter to talk about this, and a member of Quebec Solidaire is going to be speaking to any New Democrat who wants to come to the room set aside for him to speak. Here's the thing. In Quebec, there's a whole lot of, quote, social justice parties. Quebec Solidaire, the Parti Québécois, the Bloc Québécois, and the federal New Democrats. There's only one social justice party federally. And that's the New Democrats. So the federal New Democrats, there is no provincial NDP. So the federal New Democrats do end up getting a lot of these, fo these uh, folks from provincial parties, the Quebec Solidaire, that are a little more radical but still believe in social justice. They don't have anywhere else to go uh, if they want to support a federalist party or get involved on a federal scene. So you bet. The Quebec Solidaire is here. Uh, members of that party, uh, they're going to be talking to people. Uh, but again, uh, you know, let's see how far that goes with the you know, three or four hundred delegates from British Columbia or Saskatchewan who have a very different idea than the Quebec Solid Air folks do about Canada. Well, social justice, I mean, that, that's putting perfume on the pig, isn't it? I mean, isn't the pig uh, what it is? Isn't it Marxist-Leninism that they believe in? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's, there, it's you know left and, and a little bit lefter and, and really further left. You're right, but this is the this is the party of the left. It's not like the uh, n not necessarily like the the liberals and conservatives may have find some more common ground. This is the only uh, real uh, party of the left on the national spectrum. So it attracts the Marxists, the Leninists, the Trotskyites, the Maoists, you name it. And a challenge, of course, for Tom Mulcair and the federal NDP is they want to win the next election by appealing to suburban Ontario, suburban Calgary, suburban Vancouver, mainstream voters uh, who may not like Marxist, Leninism, Mao, Trotsky, etc. So uh, this is one of those things where, hey, it's, uh, it's called democracy, it's grassroots. Uh, the uh, extremists, the ideological purists, uh, they're going to try and have their uh, day in the sun here at this convention. Nicole Turmel, when she became the interim leader after uh, Jack Layton had to step aside due to a second battle with cancer, it was revealed that she actually was a card-carrying member of the Bloc Québécois for five years. And she actually terminated that membership in January of 2011, just months before the federal election, when she actually signed a form to become an NDP candidate in the election. As well, she also had been a card Caring member of the Quebec Solidaire. Now that's a left-leaning separatist provincial party in Quebec and actually she had that membership when she was the interim leader of the NDP and she actually terminated it after this became revealed in a number of news stories so certainly uh, she uh, has been a former member of two separatist parties and now she's saying that the union that she used to head up is uh, free to endorse a separatist party or any other party if it chooses me. Quebec Solidaire is the largest Marxist venue in all of Canada outside the NDP and the Communist Party of Canada. As you can see in the party's ideology section of Wikipedia, it clearly indicates that they are not only socialists and feminists, but they are anti-capitalists and Trotskyists as well. As you can evidently take from its name, anti-capitalists are mainly made up of socialists, fascists, and communists. Trotskyism is the theory of Marxism as advocated by Leon Trotsky. I find it rather incomprehensible that Nicole Turmel was able to conceal the Quebec Solidaire's ideology during the scandal. Uh, I don't think the answers this week have, have added up, and, and I think that uh, <laughs> we can't afford to have a, a party in the official opposition that is, uh, that is flaky on some matters that are pretty basic to, uh, to Canadian political life and Canadian public life. I'd like to introduce you to a member of the NDP party who goes by the name of Mathieu Ravenant. As we can see, Mr. Ravenant was a member of the Communist Party of Canada during the years it was stricken from the list of registered parties by Elections Canada. Here is a video of Mr. Ravenant delivering a speech at a PIPSC rally. So this is what solidarity looks like! Don't give up! Thank you for the warm welcome, brothers and sisters, confrères et consoeurs. I am here with you today to extend my unwavering support and the unwavering support of my party. We shouldn't mince words. On devrait dire la vérité. La réalité, c'est que le, les services publics sont attaqués par ce gouvernement. We should not mince words. The public service is under attack by this government. It's had you in its sights since the beginning. And it's going forward with changing this country of ours by attacking you. That, to them, life is simple. We must cut, cut, and cut some more. The worst is that they are doing so at the expense of people's lives. Whether it's environmental protection, EI benefits, scientific research, the development of our arts and culture. For Stephen Harper and his cabinet, no difference. He only sees unnecessary spending. 
Which is ironic when we think about the cash grabs of the major corporations this government gives to profitable banks, to the petroleum industry, and to all their friends. Now what is the PIPSC, you may ask, and how is it relevant? The Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada is the largest union in Canada which communistic goal is to destroy all Canadian small business and instate a political death grip on Canada. Now, don't you find it extremely silly that the same group of people who claim that corporate lobbying is evil, wicked, and against all human rights believe that union lobbying is a benevolent entity that only has the interest of the people of Canada at hand? Yeah, right. I would love to get into this topic some more, but that's a whole other film.